What's up, everybody? Happy Monday to you. Welcome in to Bet to Win, the Blue Wire Studios at Win Las Vegas. I'm your host, Joe Fan. What a weekend it was in the wide world of sports. My guy, Nick Day, is back on. We had him on Thursday. We got to bring him back to recap a wild UFC 274 card. I also want to talk hoops with him in a little bit of the Miami Grand Prix that happened on Sunday. Uh, what an event it was. Now, two races. In the United States, 4F1 with a third being added in 2023. Obviously, that being right here on the Las Vegas Strip. So we'll get to Nick shortly. But first, we're on a winning streak. It continues, folks. Another victory lap for your boy. Five winning picks cashed in a row. That's because the Brewers' run line cashed at minus one and a half against the Reds last Thursday. Five in a row. I will try to make it six at the end of this show uh, momentarily. NBA news this Monday morning, Nikola Jokic winning his second straight MVP. And you can just, you can taste the Philly tears from here. And you get it. Fans in Philly supporting their boy, Joel Embiid, wanted him to win the process snubbed in this process of voting for MVP. Jokic gets his second straight. But I want to set the record straight. Jokic had an unbelievable year. 68 games, a career high for him. Won the NBA scoring title at 30.6 points per game. He also had 11.7 boards and 4.2 assists. That number, a career high. That's amazing. But let's not pretend that Jokic was just like gifted his second straight MVP. He was an absolute monster carrying a poverty roster without its second and third best players in Michael Porter Jr. and Jamal Murray all year. He put up 27.1 points per game on a 58.3 field goal percentage clip, 13.8 rebounds and 7.9 assists. That's better than what he put up last year when he won MVP, when he played 72 games. So two more games. He scored more points. Last year was 26.4. He had almost three. He had three more rebounds and just a shade uh, low on the assists. But this year, 48.8 points, rebounds, and assists. A year ago, 45.5. So a big uptick there. Comparatively speaking, uh, Joel Embiid, 46.5 points, rebounds, and assists. So Jokic has an edge there. Also has a huge edge in terms of field goal percentage where Joel Embiid was sub 50 and Jokic was at 58.3. Defensively, these numbers were also very close. Where Embiid, 2.6 blocks plus steals per game. Jokic was at 2.4. This is a great note. And Sam Esfandiari, host of Light Years Podcast on Blue Wires Network, put this out this morning on Twitter. Bill Walton in 77-78 was the only MVP or is the only MVP to ever play fewer than 70 games and win the award in a full 82-game NBA season. Yo, not Jokic. Embiid would have been the second. So I get Philly fans being upset. They wanted their boy to win it. And he's obviously come back after missing two games. They lose to the Miami Heat. Now that series tied at two. But that's a separate conversation. So if you're upset about that, if you're upset about the award being strictly a regular season award, then this is a totally different conversation. That's like being an NFL fan being upset that the most valuable player goes to a quarterback every year. Different conversation. So let's not waste our energy or our faux outrage and pretend that Jokic wasn't very much deserving of the award. Congrats to the Joker on his second straight MVP. Resetting the NBA in terms of where these series are at on Saturday, the Bucks won at home, 103-101. An absolute bananas game down the stretch. Jason Tatum was woeful in this one. Giannis was not. 42-12-8 and eight for the Greek freak, the reigning finals MVP, the two-time NBA MVP, was an absolute star. He is the best player remaining in this postseason, bar none. We expect this series, I think, to go six or seven games, question mark, but on Monday night, a monster game for the Celtics to steal one in Milwaukee. They desperately need to get back home at 2-2, uh, opposed to 3-1. That goes without saying, Captain Obvious, Joe Fan. Uh, Warriors blew out the Grizzlies at home, 142-112, covering easily as seven-point favorites. Ja Morant hurt despite scoring 34-3-7. Uh, Steph Curry put up 32-6. and six. Uh, Ja will not play on Monday night, at least not expected to play, as the Warriors are 10-point favorites on Monday night in Game 4. On Sunday, the Mavs and the Sixers both won. And I can't believe both won. You look at this Mavs team. They win 111-101. They, they sort of won comfortably in each of their two games at home, taking it to the Suns, evening the series at two. This team is unbelievable. I mean, you go back to the Mavs team that won the title in the early 2010s against the Heat. 
as one of the most, in my opinion, inex- inexplicable champions in any sport in recent memory. And this team, they're a long ways from winning a title, and I don't think they will. But they've also done enough to where it's time for me to start putting some respect on their name. I've sort of been disrespecting them to the Jazz series and then expecting them to get swept in this one. I had no thought that this could ever be 2-2 going back to Phoenix. Listen, they just make shots. They execute phenomenally. They get into the paint at will. They get open looks from three at will. And you have dudes who are just stepping up. Maxi Kleber, Dorian Finney-Smith, Jalen Brunson was big on Sunday. Luka was one of 10 from three, and this team made 23 pointers. They've been, and they defend and they rebound. So they're a pain in the butt. Uh, they're sort of like how I felt about the Wolves, only they're more complete and more disciplined. Also, Sixers win at home, 116 108. They win two straight against the Miami Heat. Welcome to the postseason, James Harden. Dude's been an absolute joke for a series and a half, but he exploded for 31, 7, and 9, 6 of 10 from 3, where he'd been woeful throughout this postseason, including finally some signature moments, a couple dagger threes to beat the Heat. Jimmy Butler put up a 40-burger to go along with three boards and six assists, not enough, as the Miami returns home tied 2-2. This second round of the postseason was an absolute snooze from the jump. And all of a sudden, we've got three really good series and one series that I would anticipate I would anticipate is over. That's the Warriors again on Monday. 10-point favorites against the Grizzlies. Total set at 223.5. Uh, Bucks one-point favorites against the Celtics. That total continues to rise at 212.5, which is interesting because every Bucks game so far this postseason has gone under. Uh, the Bucks lead that series 2-1. to one. Huge game on Monday night for the Celtics. Then on Tuesday, a pair of game fives, a pair of really fun game fives. Both those series tied 2-2. Suns, six-point favorites at home against the Mavs. The Heat, three-and-a-half-point favorites at home against the Sixers. You know, what's fun is neither of those series has started yet. You know what I tell you? The series doesn't start till the road team wins. Neither road team has won a game yet. The home team's holding serve thus far. Now a three-game series in each of those matchups with the Suns-Mavs and Heat Sixers. All right, let's get my guy Nick Dayus in here. We'll talk hoops with him, but first, I need to speak with this guy about UFC 274 because your boys got some thoughts. We had him in on Thursday, had to bring him back for the Monday show. He is the host and founder of Blue Wire's Veterans Minimum Podcast. Follow him on Twitter at Nick Dayus 10 Nick, lots to discuss. I want to dive right into what happened on Saturday night because it was a wild card, and I love talking about it going into it, having an expectation of how it all might play out. Let's get... The, the co-main out of the way first. And, dude, I'm sitting there at my buddy's house. We're watching this. And I love that, A, the crowd is booing. B, that Joe Rogan and the whole broadcast team is clowning this fight. Joe Rogan then goes into Carla Esparza and is like, I don't even know how the judges judge this because nothing happened. To her face after she just won the title, the biggest moment of her career, arguably. I don't know if I've ever seen, and I know, granted, I am very green and wet behind the ears when it comes to the UFC and combat sports in general. But that was the biggest snooze fest of a fight that I think I've ever I've ever witnessed. Dude, you don't need to be watching the UFC for many years to be able to have that take. Like, you are absolutely right. I couldn't believe it. And the thing that was so unfortunate, Joe, is Rose has given us so many moments. She's had classic five-round fights. She's had the head kick knockout. She's slept Joanna, who was this unbeatable woman in the 115 division for so many years. And she's just had so many iconic moments. And this is just going to be another iconic moment for all the wrong reasons. As far as judging that fight, I couldn't believe what the score was going to be. Right, Like uh, we were making jokes and we were watching it with my friends, Joe, about how they should just vacate this title. Too, That's and be what like, I you thought. Guys were sh- this That's was so bad. Yeah, and I think what it really came down to, Joe, the only thing that you could really score the fight on would be the takedowns. But even so, takedowns are so subjective to what you believe, what I believe, right? You might be a judge, Joe, that scores a takedown as a a good thing, right? I might be someone that says, you know what? Yeah, you get the takedown, but what do you do with it? Yeah, Rose on all the takedown attempts that Carla landed on her got right back up to her feet. But it's technically on the score sheet 
it's a takedown. And then Rose ends the fight with a takedown. As someone that had so many money line parlays with Rose, I was <laughs> I was more so angry. I was more so angry at the fight itself than I was like losing on my bets because I just couldn't believe it. I was so frustrated as a fan. I think I, I tweeted this out. I mean, Rose spent 25 minutes just sitting on her belt saying she's got to beat me for them to take this belt from me. And I don't think you can say that Carla Esparza really beat her, which is why in my perfect world, Dana White comes in and says, hey, there is no winner. This title is vacated and we'll try again with two other people. I mean, I'm trying to think of Carla Esparza's next title fight when they put this strawweight belt back on the line. It's going to be on like PBS on like a Tuesday afternoon. No one's going to want to watch her fight again after what just happened on Saturday night. And you even look at, I have so many thoughts on this one. I, I was obsessed. I, was like, I can't wait to talk to Nick about this because I was so angry, which is a first for me watching any sort of fight. Uh, Rose, Rose should be upset with everyone in her corner who was telling her that everything was going to plan. Um, and then on top of that, um, going for like, a, a again, we talked meaningless takedowns with like eight seconds left in the fifth round. She basically takes her down, pins her against the fence, doesn't do anything with it, fight ends. And that was, she puts her arms up like, that was it. Like, that's all I needed. I needed to exert a little bit of energy with 10 seconds left in the fight. And that was going to get me a win. I don't know, I just threw a lot at you, but I'm just frustrated. <laughs> no, nah, I hear you, man. You know, la last time I was in Vegas, we saw this girl, uh, Marina Rodriguez fight. And she's number three in the division. They just booked Wei Li and Joanna, who in 2020 had arguably one of the greatest MMA fights of all time. It's easily the, the best woman's fight of all time. And that was a five-round decision where the crowd was very conflicted. Joe, I was at that event for UFC 248. And people were like, oh, you know what? I thought Joanna won. I thought Wei Li won. It was very, you know, polar opposites. I think Carla is going to get the winner of that fight. And you are 100% right. It's not going to be on a pay-per-view, even though it's for a title. I think they do this as a fight night Boston end of July or early August. And that would be the headliner for an ESPN Plus card. I don't think you could put Carla, who has always kind of had these type of fights, Joe, too. I think more so the disappointment was on the Rose end than it was Carla. Because Carla, it was a striker versus grappler. We spoke about this. And a lot of times, one is so much better than the other at the other thing that it turns into what you see now. Yeah, I think just frustrating when you have yeah, a fighter like Rose, who I think we all view as the, the vastly superior fighter, not mm -hmm. exploit her advantages against an inferior fighter. Let's talk about the two fights that didn't disappoint. Um, starting with the actual main event, uh, and that was Charles Oliveira um, putting uh, Justin Gaethje to sleep in the second round. First round, sorry. This is, it's, I feel like every time I've watched Oliveira fight, it's sort of been like this, where he takes some knocks early, and he did in this fight. It was the same thing, I think, in the Poirier fight earlier. And all of a sudden, fight's over. And he's so dangerous when he gets you to the ground. You saw even when he got knocked down in the first, what, 30 seconds of the fight, he lays on his back, hoping Gaethje will, will get on top of him. Gaethje says, no, 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 we're going to fight this on our feet. Sure enough, he ends up losing uh, to via submission. I guess, yeah, I'm just tossing it back to you. I mean, this fight kind of went as you expected, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, Joe, I want to start by going back to Friday when uh, things really got shaken up with the weight with the weight miss. Yep. Can't miss Here's that. the thing, and I was I was tweeting about it. I spoke about it on um, a video I did also. The idea that people were off Oliveira after that weight miss was mind-blowing to me. If you liked Oliveira going into this fight, which I did, nothing should have changed because, Joe, he did, the, the, first, the first big thing is making weight, right? But he missed weight by half a pound. Eventually, your body just stops cutting. It, you ask any fighter this, sometimes they'll just stop cutting. And if you ever hear of a fighter, he missed weight by four pounds, and then you get the feedback like Rob Font Two cards ago in the main event, he met, he missed weight at 138. He, he was supposed to make 135. He comes in at 138. He's like, I feel fine. I just, you know, my body just couldn't cut any more weight. Oliveira looked fine on the scale. He didn't look sucked out. He didn't look like he was stumbling or holding on to something to keep his balance. So this idea that all the money, the line really closed at like plus 124 for Gaethje when we were talking about it at plus 145. 
So this idea that because Oliveira got stripped of the title, this fight was only a lose-lose for him in the sense of, well, if he does win, he's still not the champ. And if he loses, Gaethje is the only one that can win the belt. And Joe, we talked about it. The way you should have bet that main event is Oliveira by submission or Gaethje by knockout. That was the only two paths to victories for both fighters. And Oliveira, one of the reasons why I think it took so long for people to get on board with him being a champion is because this guy was a journeyman. He was 22 and 8 in the US, as a professional. And then he rattles off this now 11 fight win streak. And he was losing to guys that were not top five, top 10 guys. And in all of his fights, the Chandler fight where he won the title, the Poirier fight, even Gaethje, he gets stunned. He looks vulnerable. But on the ground, Joe, you want nothing to do with him. And you saw exactly why. And it's amazing. He goes from one submission attempt. It looked like Gaethje sort of got free. And then it was like, oh, no, this is, and he just, he, he adjusts so quickly. Another fight that, I mean, you talk about the Michael Chandler, Tony Ferguson fight, another fight where Tony Ferguson probably won round one and then out of nowhere takes a vicious kick to the jaw and he's put to sleep. Kind of a scary knockout, honestly. Um, I guess that's sort of the fun of UFC, not the, the scary knockout as a poor transition on my part, but how quickly these fights can change where it feels like one guy, one guy in the house where I was watching it says, gosh, I knew I should have put money on Tony Ferguson as the underdog. I knew it. After watching that first round, 15 seconds after that leaves his mouth, he's like, oh, yeah, well, all right. Guess it's a good thing I didn't bet. Uh, it, does Michael dude, Chandler, gotta, is he now, does he get to fight with Oliveira for the title? So real quick, let me tell you a funny story about that. I had told you that I would live bet Tony after round one yeah. if he survived that, right? So I'm at my buddy's house. I don't have the Wi-Fi. I can't get my location services on, so I can't sign on to the app. And I'm cursing him out. I'm like, dude, what are you doing, man? What kind of, you know, you pay all this money for this apartment. You don't even have good Wi-Fi. And then as I'm trying to load in, I miss the front kick because I'm on my phone trying to put my bed in. And then I just turn to him. I'm like, hey, man, it's the IPAs talking. I, I didn't mean all that. And Thanks up, so much. And for up, that's me. on me. Appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, as, as far as Chandler goes, so Chandler has lost to Oliveira before. That's how Oliveira won the title. Yeah. I think Chandler is in a spot where he's going to get a big fight because all of his fights in the UFC have been finishes. And the only one that wasn't was fight of the year against Gaethje in, in Madison Square Garden. So Chandler, I think, in, 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 if I could do some fantasy booking, Chandler should get the winner of Islam or Dariush, which was supposed to be a title eliminator. I think what you do with Poirier and Gaethje is run that back because Gaethje has been very adamant about wanting to win, get that win back in in the sense of he lost to Poirier before. Chandler called out Connor. Oliveira called out Connor. Joe, the juice is temporary, but the sauce lasts forever. And Connor McGregor got the sauce. Everybody wants Connor because it's a massive, it's a seven figure payday. And they just want the top dog. And despite what you feel about Conor McGregor, you're going to tune into his next fight and you see the who's who of names. They still want that fight. So Chandler is in a cool spot because he's so entertaining. He has all these bonuses, all these finishes, and it's a kill or be killed kind of approach that he has in his fight. So that's what I think is next for him. That and he, that guy on the mic is like the rock in his heyday uh -huh. and like the attitude era of WWE, man. I mean, that dude cuts a, a promo like, Nobody I've ever seen. Do you think Connor hey, fights as a, again? As a huge, as a huge wrestling fan, I, I co-sign everything you just said there. And and in regards to Connor, Connor still isn't ready. Like Connor's doing all these um, drilling videos he puts up, but you know it's it hasn't even been a year since we saw his ankle get shattered. I think we see Connor at the end of the year, probably the December card that is usually in Vegas. He'll probably headline that, and. There, there are a lot of different approaches you could do with Connor. You, you could, people are not going to like this, but he's built himself up to the point where he could come back and get a title shot. He's Connor McGregor. He's outgrown. He's one of the few athletes, Joe, that I've seen in my life being able to understand sports that has outgrown the sport. He's bigger than, than MMA. He's bigger than the UFC. And if he comes back and gets a title shot, it's not going to be a surprise to me, but the MMA purist, even Justin Gaethje said, if Connor comes back and gets a title shot, like, what am I doing? You know, I have to go through the rankings. This guy has lost three of his last four fights. His only win was Cowboy. That looks awful because Cowboy's lost five straight fights. 
It's like, what do you do? What do you do if you're not Conor McGregor? But we, we see Conor fight again. Absolutely. And Conor will get to pick his, I mean, even whether it's for the title or not, he'd get to pick his opponent. I mean, if he says, I'm not coming, the only way I'm coming back is if it's Michael Chandler or whomever. Yeah. And, and what's interesting, Dana White said this, and I thought it was very, it, it was on point where, you know, things change month to month, event to event. If prior to this fight, if Chandler was calling out Connor, I'd be like, dude, we're not, Chandler's not going to fight Connor. Like, who wants to see that? And then you get the front kick knockout, you get this promo, you get these backflips. And it's just things change month to month, and every fight is different. And then Connor's tweeting at him, like, I would love to get in there with him. So now it's, you know, Connor is intrigued too. So yeah. it's, Connor is just always going to get the the mat, all the attention and and all the blame, depending on what side of the spectrum you are, uh, as far as Conor McGregor goes. Okay, putting a bow on the UFC conversation. What's next uh, in terms of UFC pay per views and big fights that we can look to down the road in the next month or two? So next month it's going to be in Singapore. It's a uh, two title fights as well. Valentina Shevchenko is uh, probably the best women's fighter on the planet right now. Um, she seems unbeatable at 125. She's fighting Santos, who at this point, Joe, they're just trying to find new blood for Valentina. She's currently minus 900. So that lets you know how people expect that fight to go. Okay. And then you got Glover, Glover Teixeira against Yuri Prokoshka. Yeah, I saw these promos, dude. And I was going to say, I, I have no idea who these guys are. So give me the, give me the so, phone down. So Glover is a legend in the sport. He's over 40. Went on this insane, like, Last hole of his career run, and now he's a champion. Yuri has had two fights in the UFC, and now he's fighting for the belt. Uh, that's something that rarely happens as well. But the 205 division is in, I don't want to say in flux, but there's not a lot in the 205 division right now. And Yuri came in, two big finishes of two top guys in uh, uh, Uzdemir and then Dominic Reyes, who had last fought John Jones. John Jones leaves, goes to heavyweight. And Prohaska is the favorite, despite being the challenger. Uh, Joe, in the last 25 fights that the champion has been the underdog in the title fights, 19 and 6 is the underdog champion. So that's something to think about when you look at Glover at plus 155 in this fight next month. Okay. Store that one away for future reference. Uh, <laughs> Nick, are you mad that Jokic won MVP? <clears throat> no, I'm not. I'm not at all. I'm mad that they are giving out this award now more than I am him winning the MVP. I think if you give out this award now, you're hearing all the narratives and all the talking points now. How can you give an MVP to a guy that won one game in the playoffs? His team isn't playing anymore. And B comes back from the injury. They dropped two to Miami without him. Now the series is tied at two apiece going back to South Beach. Uh, you see what Giannis is doing without Middleton. And those are the three guys in the discussion. I felt like when the season ended, Jokic was the MVP because he didn't have his two best players with him all season long. They didn't have Jamal Murray all year. Porter gets paid in the offseason. Then he misses, what, 70% of the season? And throughout the entire regular season, Joe, the Nuggets were never in the playing game. They were always a top six seed. Historically, you need to be a top three seed, with the exception being Westbrook the year he had the triple-double for you to win MVP. But Jokic just was the be-all, end-all for the Nuggets. And to me, I'm fine with the award being given to Jokic. I'm not fine with it being given out today as we have this conversation. I get that. Absolutely. Um, the Sixers and Mavs each tied the series at 2-2, winning both their home games. Um, between those two series, the Boston series, and you obviously finish it out with the Grizzlies against the Warriors, which one goes seven? Are the Grizzlies cooked? And can either the Sixers or the Mavs actually pull this series out as the underdog? As far as Memphis goes, yeah. If, if Ja, ja is going to miss game four, they'll be down 3-1. You know, they're a nine-point underdog. I think eight-and-a-half-point underdog to Golden State in Golden State. I think that series ends in five. Uh, especially if John not playing in game four. We don't know what his status is the rest of the uh, series. I think them dropping game one, Joe, is really what is going to haunt them the entire offseason. Um, I think the series that goes seven is probably Miami and Philly. And that's the one where I can see the lower seed getting the upset. Now, I know both one seeds are at two apiece. 
But there's not enough firepower on Dallas. I think they just took care of business at home in the two games. You're not going to expect Finney Smith to go hit eight three-pointers in game five and in game six and in potentially game seven. So I think that the Suns take care of business. I think Miami is a little bit... I'm more concerned with Miami just because you get Embiid back and Harden balling out. I mean, I've been a harsh Harden critic this entire postseason run and throughout his career, but he balled out yesterday, man. You got to give him his props. And Philly's a tough, tough opponent, especially when they play at home. On the road, you could get him. So I think Miami, the winner of game five is is probably going to win this series. And I know that's not really a, a, a steaming hot take, but that's that's how I feel those series are going to go down. Yeah, I like it. And then finally, I want to finish with this. The Miami Grand Prix, first ever for F1 in South Beach. I, I saw on Twitter, it was your first time watching a race. That means you probably don't watch F1 Drive to Survive on Netflix. If you if you haven't, you need to. It'll give you the itch if you've got it. It'll, it'll make you a, a fan. I really enjoyed it. What was your takeaway from what happened with Max Verstappen winning for Red Bull? Yeah, Joe, it's it's fascinating, right? Because my my background is, uh, you know, like my family's from Greece. Uh, my dad loves F1. Um, anytime we would have it on TV when I lived at home, I was like, dude, what are you watching? Like, you know, get this out of here. Uh, but he loves it. He watches all the Grand Prix. And then this Netflix show comes out and I was reading this article from uh, Business Journal and they were saying how now F1, the biggest fan base is in the United States. And a lot of it, the credit was to this documentary series that came out. Also happened during COVID. So everyone's sitting at home. Dude, I was glued to the TV. I couldn't believe it. First of all, the guy, uh, Martin, who was doing all the interviews, uh, mixes up. <laughs> he's, he's, going, he's like, hey, Patrick Mahomes of the Kansas City Chiefs. He goes up to him and he's interviewing him. I'm like, yo, that's not Pat Mahomes. And then he's like, oh, this is why he was ignoring me. Sorry. So that was hilarious. I was glued to the TV. He's chasing, there. He's chasing David around. Beckham around. David Beckham. Yeah, yeah. DJ Khaled and everyone. And uh, I, I know of Lewis Hamilton. I feel like he's... Similar to Connor in the sense of like Lewis Hamilton was a household name for many years. Like, all right, he's a Formula One guy, but he's outgrown Formula One. And then I had all my buddies hitting up the group chat. I'm like, dude, when you guys are you, you guys are F1 fans since when? And they're like telling me about, you know, you got to pick teams, not so much drivers. And, you know, a driver, if us two are on Ferrari, I might sacrifice a lap to get you. It's just craziness that goes down and all the politics behind it. But I watched the entire race. I've never watched the race before. I was glued to the TV. I was, it was, it was very entertaining. It was a blast. It is amazing to to see what a documentary, and it was done very well by Netflix. What it's mm -hmm. done for F one, and you see, like the PGA Tour has adopted. You know, they've everyone's bought into a sort of similar behind the scenes all access documentary to try to get the same get the same bang for it. Because you've seen what's done for F one. It is fun. The drama, the money behind it, the politics. Uh, the the pageantry of it all, it is pretty incredible. And now, obviously, you know they they know their fan base in America is getting so big, and they're adding Las Vegas in twenty twenty three. So, um, really, it just feels like the beginning, early innings here. Dude, behind the scenes, I think adds so many wrinkles to sports that it, you see the NFL does it with like inside the NFL or the NBA. They'll have people mic'd up. Joe, I'm not the biggest baseball fan. I follow the Mets. I could tell you what you need to know about the Mets. I can't tell you about the Reds. I can't tell you about the Padres. Just, you know, it's not entertaining to me. Two weeks ago, the Mets were playing on Sunday night against the Phillies and Lindor was mic'd up and I was glued to my TV. I was like, what the hell is this? I've never seen this. He's fielding ground balls, talking to the commentary team. He's talking in Spanish. I'm like, yo, this is awesome. Like they need to do this for all games. This gives you another entertainment value to the event that you're watching because you know, baseball tries its best to get so many, you know, younger fans to get people to the ball games and to tune in. But when you do things like that, I think it adds another dimension that's like super entertaining to me. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. He is Nick Day, is the host and founder of the Veterans Minimum Podcast on Blue Wires Network of Podcasts. Follow him on Twitter at Nick Dayus10. Nick, my guy, thanks so much, man. I was double duty here this week. We had you Thursday, but given what happened on Saturday night, man, I had to talk to you ASAP. So thanks so much. For the insight, as always, sir. Anytime, Joe. You know I got you. Big thanks to my guy, Nick. Hey, that guy's always full of info, and I love... It's it's fun now because I feel like I'm starting to learn the UFC a little bit to where I can I can give back some thoughts and opinions with him. Uh, obviously, he's still our resident expert here on Bet to Win on all things combat sports. Uh, 
Let's get some free money out there to you. A winning pick and get on out of here. WinBet's 50 or Bet 50 Win $200 promo is still running. New WinBet users can receive $200 in free bets after they make their first qualifying deposit and place their first bet on WinBet. Once that bet is settled, you will receive four installments of $50 free bets. Go to winbet.com or download the WinBet app for official rules and details. Winning pick time, 2-0 and in May. Five in a row, going back to April, trying to make it a cool six for six. I'm going chalky, but you know what? Sometimes it remains good to bet on good teams to beat bad teams. Dodgers, first five minus a half a run. So they have to win outright. Ties are not a push. I'm taking the run line in the first five against the Pirates in Pittsburgh. That's at minus 140, a little juicy, but I feel good about this. Dodgers, obviously one of the best teams in baseball. You don't need me to explain that. Julio Urias has been tremendous. A 188 ERA and a sub one whip in 24 innings pitched this year. And the Pirates rank 23rd in weighted runs created against lefties. They've been bad against lefties. Urias has already been really good. The Dodgers, best team in baseball, arguably. Easy pick here. Dodgers first five, minus a half a run at the Pirates at minus 140. That's going to be a wrap for the show of Bet to Win. A uh, big show coming to you on Wednesday this week, not Thursday. We're going to do Wednesday. My guy, Chris Long of the Greenlight Podcast, is going to join me here on Bet to Win. We will see you then. Until then, enjoy a couple days of epic hoops, baseball, and everything in between. We'll see you soon.